Before we head into the international break, the fixture gods have conspired to gift us mortals with a weekend full of grudge matches. Tigres against Rayados, Ajax against Feyenoord, River against Boca, Marseille against Nice, Roma against Lazio, and of course, Real Madrid against Barcelona. The Kiego Lasso weekend preview with Jonathan Johnson, Mike LaHood begins right now. Everybody, welcome to Kego Lasso. Thank you so much for being part of the family. Kego Lasso pod on Twitter. We continue to grow. Thank you so much. 10,000 subscribers and counting on YouTube. And by the way, everybody, we have a winner. Congratulations, Ray House. You are the winner of yesterday's Paramount Plus $100 subscription giveaway. Check your DMs. Our producer uh, will be in touch about how to redeem your prize. And thank you so much, everybody helping us to continue to grow we can't do this without you make sure you that you subscribe and spread the word etc etc jonathan johnson how are you buddy hey great to be back on with you guys doing very well thanks and yourself uh we're good we're good so happy to have you here at jj uh michael lahoud looking good with that shirt my man how are you Oof. i'm doing fine and happy saint patrick's day to all of you Abs- up up the irish up the ethiopians because i'm rocking them today I love it. I love it. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. We're taping this, of course, on Thursday. If you're watching on YouTube, it will be on St. Patrick's Day. If you're listening to this on Friday, well, St. Patrick's Day should be every single day. So whatever. But welcome, everybody, to Kigo Lasso, our weekend preview. Michael Lahu, Jonathan Johnson. Let's begin, as we mentioned in the intro, some massive games before the international break. Uh, you know, massive in terms of rivalry, definitely all over Europe and beyond. But let's begin in what is surely the biggest one. El Clásico historically has always been such a big fixture, but since the exit of Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, it's been a little bit underwhelming, I guess. But I think, Jonathan Johnson, this one hopefully will be such a big one because Barcelona is doing well and Real Madrid, of course, uh, you know, in the Champions League quarterfinals and topping the league. What say you, my friend, as Real Madrid host Barcelona? Yeah, I mean, this one's going to be really interesting for a number of reasons. I think maybe the most exciting thing about it is it finally feels like we're going into a Clásico with both teams on the up, which is the first time in, uh, in in quite a while. You know, Real sort of prolonging the um, sort of the the longevity of this uh, this group. There's a lot of veterans, as we've discussed in the last couple of weeks around Champions League, but you know, they're still uh, putting in the performances, getting the results in La Liga and Barca. You know, have really. Uh, you know, turn things around massively since the last time we looked ahead to one of these games. And I think the the Clásico earlier this season uh, was the final uh, goal scored by Sergio Aguero in his career. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's uh, it, it's going to be a lot different to, to that game because I remember being struck, um, you know, obviously it's a huge event, uh, a Clásico, but I remember being struck by just how sort of poor I thought the fixture had become compared to what we were used to in the years before. So I think now to be going back into it, you know, the fixture, the rivalry is in a lot better health, uh, you know, and it's amazing what a, a couple of months can do in terms of a, a turnaround. It's amazing what a couple of goals can do in terms of a turnaround. These are two teams who are getting back a bit to what makes them successful for Real Madrid. They've always had a striker who can dominate leagues. Big Ben's current Benzema. He's playing the football of his life, arguably the best player in the world. I'm sure Mohamed Salah and Robert Lewandowski will have something to say about that as the Champions League progresses. But Real Madrid have always been dependent on a striker who can score a bazillion goals. And when the team needs them most, he steps up and he's, he has stepped up in European competition and La Liga. Just when you thought he was finished scoring goals against PSG, he comes in at the weekend, bags a couple more. And then for Barcelona, they now have a striker, not one, but they have depth at the striker position. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. I'm not going to give Troops a shout out, so I'm not even going to say how Troops says it, but Aubameyang, this guy, the Valencia game, that's when he truly announced himself to La Liga, banging in a hat trick. And that's so important for a striker to get that goal get the early impressive performance and he's just settled in and he's enjoying himself in La Liga competition he is enjoying himself this will be a big test for him of course as he uh, faces Real Madrid at the Bernabeu a hostile environment and by the way uh, with their Super Cup semi-final victory in January 
of this year, 3-2. Real Madrid became the first team in a classical history to reach 100 wins across all competitions. They've won their last five games with Barcelona in all competitions, but Barcelona have more wins and scored more goals than Real Madrid in this classical fixture played in Madrid in the 21st century. Something has to give. I'm wondering here, Jonathan Johnson, as we look at these two teams, and obviously, you know, a lot was going on midweek as well, you know, and well, not just midweek, but I guess uh, through the course of the last two weeks with Real Madrid in the Champions League and Barcelona trying to, as we tape, they still have to face Galatasaray. We have to see what happens there. So what do you expect in this fixture? Which way are we going, do you think? Because this is massive. It's big because Barcelona, obviously, aside from beating, you know, their bitter rivals, they have to remain in the Champions League contention for a top four spot. It is big, but also at the same time, you know, I don't want to sort of overplay this. I don't think that there's going to be any way that Barca can sort of relaunch any uh, title ambitions with this game. I think Real are too far ahead, even if Barca do win this game. But you're right. You know, I think this Europa League clash uh, against Galatasaray doesn't really come at the, the best time for them. I mean, perhaps if the the the, the legs had been reversed and they were playing at home the second leg it wouldn't be as bad but you know going to Turkey it's going to be a hostile atmosphere it's going to take a lot from the players uh, you know to come away with a result especially a result in uh, in 90 minutes because if they end up going to extra time as well that's just going to drain them even more so I think it's absolutely crucial uh, ahead of this game that the Barca get either get the job done in 90 minutes or they drop out uh, in 90 minutes I think extra time and potentially penalties uh, you know will just be a disaster heading into this game but at the same time you know there is an international break just around the corner uh you know so to, these two sides can uh, can get a bit of rest you know Barca have managed to turn things around quite nicely getting themselves back into Champions League contention in the league uh sadly it's come at the expense of uh of, of my favorites Real Betis but uh you know there's still a long way to go in this season but I think it, this game feels almost more important for Barca than it does uh for Real especially given those positions at the top of the table right now and I think for Barcelona, the, the biggest thing they have in their camp is belief. There is the fighting Barcelona spirit. There's a sense of civic pride that Xavi's instilled. Yes, the international stars, your Aubameyangs, have come in and they started producing. And I think Adama Traore, he's the guy coming from Wolves and the Premier League. And they just injected a bit of pace to this team that was lacking. They mm -hmm. had the Tiki Taka, which Tiki Taka was dying in Catalonia. But that change of pace. Usman Dembele looks to be resuscitated back to life. But I think that civic pride, that's always is what made El Clasico the game to watch across the world. It's been, you know, Madrid, Madridistas and Catalonians, they hate each other when it comes to soccer. And you're starting to get that. And I, I, that's what makes me excited about this matchup. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, it's going to be an intriguing one. And of course, Spain, La Liga remains to be exciting. Let's have a look at the remaining fixtures as well, the other fixtures in La Liga des Norris as we look ahead to another uh, weekend of Spanish action before the international break. And of course, as you have it, as you see it, the, you know, it all begins, by the way, on Friday with Athletic Bilbao. And pay attention, everybody, to our YouTube channel. And of course, CBS Sports has had a great chat, by the way, with uh, the Williams brothers, Iñaki and Nico Williams. A really tremendous story. Make sure that you check that out. But any fixtures from that, Jonathan Johnson, that you like, that you think, mm, you know what, let's have a look at that. Yeah, you know, I'm looking at uh, the bottom of that list. Sevilla, Sociedad, you know, two teams capable of playing some very, very attractive football. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd fancy myself a bit of that. Uh, obviously, I'll keep my eye out on what uh, Betis do away at Celta. Uh, you know, never an easy game. But for me, I think it has to be uh, Sevilla, Sociedad. Uh, you know, and it's a perfect warm up as well for the Clasico, uh, you know, Sevilla. Interested to know how they do uh, against West Ham in the second leg of their Europa League uh, clash, uh, which will happen after we tape this. Uh, but, you know, it's been a real season of progress, solid progress for, uh, for Sevilla. Uh, you know, and it doesn't surprise me to see them where they are in the table at this moment. Michael? I said, I said it the other day. I'm Atleti, you have just irked me with your result at Old Trafford. So I'm going to stick with you on the games <laughs> that I'm keeping an eye on. But I think that Atleti game, as we're talking about El Clasico, Atleti, they're playing against a Rayo Vallecano team that loves to play against teams from Madrid. They pushed Real Madrid to the limit, and I think they're going to do the same. I think Atleti, they're in that Champions League 
race with Barcelona to get those spots. And they're going to be exhausted. They put a lot of energy towards that game at Old Trafford in the Champions League. And it'll be interesting to see how they respond. You know that they're one of the fittest teams in La Liga, though. So that's going to be a, a key difference maker to see how much energy they have to go against Rio. Absolutely. Well, that was Spain, but we have so much more action, including El Super Clásico River against Boca. That's Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern, streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus, Both teams coming off some big wins. This is a massive game, of course, in Argentina, and the fact that you can watch it on Paramount+, Plus is massive. River are continuing from, of course, that historic uh, league victory uh, with Marcelo Gallardo, uh, you know, have won, uh, you know, four matches, only lost one. They've scored a lot of goals, including 13, of course, including the, the previous matchup that where they went off. And they've been doing pretty well, taking in mind, of course, you know, the news of Julian Alvarez, who's going to Man City, but he remains uh, at River for the moment. But Boca Juniors as well, you know, in the other phase of Argentina Primera División. And they have, um, they've been okay, not as strong as River Plate. So this would be a contentious game. The results and fixtures from the past obviously mean nothing when these two teams face each other. And that's Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern, streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. A massive, massive game. We're going to take a break. When we come back, Jonathan Johnson, Michael LaHood, LME will be discussing some Italian soccer, of course, Serie A, which also you can watch exclusively on Paramount Plus, as well as Premier League fixtures, some other fixtures. Uh, JJ will give us the League A lowdown as well. We'll talk about some other games of interest, some final thoughts, and much, much more. Gigo Lasso Week and Preview, Jonathan Johnson, Michael LaHood, LME. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Fans of Italian soccer, remember to join Colin Calcio every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern live on the QG YouTube channel and then later on on the QG podcast feed. Every week, Kristen Cooper and a revolving cast of characters from Paramount Plus Serie A team will discuss the biggest stories from the Italian top flight, preview the games and speak with the Calcio-loving community. There may not be Italian teams in the Champions League anymore, but Serie A continues to excite us. And we got some great games this weekend. Let's begin, by the way, with a good one in the capital, Roma against Lazio. Michael LaHood, this is going to be a big one. We've just seen, um, obviously, the England national team set up for their friendlies. Tammy Abraham's in it. He's a massive part of Roma, of course, as they face Lazio, uh, Chiro Immobile and Lazio. This is going to be a good one. Talk to me about that one. Uh, Tammy Abraham is having a wonderful season. And just when you thought he broke out at Chelsea, he takes it one step further. I thought he was crazy to follow Jose Mourinho. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, he didn't break out at Chelsea. He broke out at Villa Park. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan Johnson. That's right. <laughs> well, he's re- – hey, hey, there's there's multiple chapters of breaking out in the Tammy <laughs> Abraham saga. Yeah, we'll, we'll get he, he, ca- he came of age. In <laughs> well, get this is a Paramount <laughs> Plus documentary. You can sign it on that. But he's taken it another step further in his game and his development, and he's banging goals in Syria. But he ain't no cheer or mobile. This guy, no matter whether he's injured or suspended, he just has a nose for goal. He's the prototypical Syria striker, and he, he likes to score goals in big games. He delivers when Lazio need him most. That's why they've been in European competition year in and year out since he's gone back to Lazio. I think Roma, they've identified themselves under Mourinho this season as serial choke artists in big games. They've only gotten a result against one top six or seven team, and that was against mm. Atalanta. They've gotten spanked in all the rest, and they've been score- struggling to score goals as of late. Although Tammy Abraham is their talisman, that doesn't bode well going into you know a derby game. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, you know, I think as well what we forget about that win over Atalanta is it came after some very dubious refereeing decisions as well. Uh, you remember Gasparini being absolutely furious about that. So, you know, for me, I'm really curious to see how this one pans out. I mean, obviously, we've spoken about the battle of the strikers, as we can see uh, on the screen at the moment, and that in itself is going to be fascinating. But the other thing as well is these kind of games seem to bring out the best in Maurizio Sarri as well. You know, his his Lazio team seem to click 
when they're coming up against a higher quality opponent. They're, they're a little similar to Napoli in a way where I think they measure themselves against the opponents that they play. And if they're not playing one of the top teams in Serie A, then they'll quite often struggle to, you know, to dictate the tempo uh, and go after the result, which is why they're sort of in and around uh, you know, sort of the cusp of the European positions. But to have seen Roma booted out of it, Fiorentina as well, although they've got that game in hand, you know, this is a key key match for, for both of them because everyone's going to be looking towards Atalanta, towards Fiorentina, sort of with that extra game to play, uh, you know, because somebody is going to be missing out, especially given the way that Juventus have improved uh, and look like they're probably not going to be caught now in that final Champions League spot. So for me, I think this this has the potential to be a really really huge game uh you know and Mourinho uh you know as, as you said earlier he's, he's kind of almost becoming the specialist in failure that that he was joking about years ago uh when it comes to these big matches I mean we've we've read so much and seen so many sort of negative things coming out of, of Roma since those very positive early few games uh you know it it really feels quite underwhelming now at this point Mourinho you know he went back uh to Serie A as like this returning hero because everyone remembered him from his success with Inter Milan. And then suddenly this Roma side, at times they seem quite flat. And I think as well, they they kind of almost remind me a bit of a Ligue 1 side where they're not really cut out to be competing in uh, at the top of the, the domestic tree and in Europe. It's sort of one or the other. Uh, I think their squad is a little too thin. Uh, you know, for them to have had glory on both fronts, which is why we see them, uh, you know, getting these unexpected, uh, disappointing results, which has put European qualification in jeopardy. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you know, all of that in a way goes out the window when a derby comes into place and, you know, it's about pride and effort. And by the way, after the win three two, uh, winning 3-2 in the reverse fixture, Lazio could win two Serie A games in a row against Roma for the first time since November 2012. It's been a, a while. That's when they did it three in a row. But Roma are unbeaten at home against Lazio and Serie A since April 2017. But to JJ's point, Jose Mourinho's, uh, you know, a squad can give you surprising things. It's going to be an intriguing one. Let's go. I mean, give me a quick prediction. What, what do you see in this one, Michael? Oof. I, well, I, I can guarantee you a red card because this fixture, <laughs> <At least. laughs> this fixture always delivers. This and the Milan derby, they always deliver fireworks, both on the score sheet and in the stats books for the cards department. So I'm saying one red card, and I am going to go 2-0 Lazio. I think Mourinho is going to be fuming. The special one is going to be dubbed officially the specialist in failure, joining Arsene Wenger in that special club as he dubbed it once <laughs> jj yeah this one uh th th this one for me i it feels like it has lazio win written all over it i mean i remember pedro uh, a couple of months back starring in that first uh the first leg of the the derby or the first installment of the derby this season so i agree i, I can't really see past uh lazio but i think this one will be a bit tighter um i might go for a 2-1 you know i'm hoping there's going to be as many goals as there are going to be uh, cards and flashpoints, uh, you know, because this this derby rarely fails to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. Are, are, you, well, are, are you saying yeah, that, ahead, JJ? Michael. Are you saying that JJ because of the Tammy Abraham shout? You, you <laughs> wanting Tammy to bang it in up there for the no. villains? <laughs> No, not necessarily. I mean, I'm 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 always happy to see him doing well. I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Jordan Veritu as well. A bit of a Villa link there as well. I mean, I love Jordan. It's then. just it's just occurring to me while we're having this chat that Roma is actually just becoming like a, a, like a, an ex Villa boys club. Yeah, it, it's yeah. A, it's a retro <laughs> Villa. That's right. That's exactly what they're doing. Uh, well, anyway, there's another big game uh, in Serie A as Inter Milan, who are a point. Uh, sorry, a game behind Milan, who stopped with 63 points, and Napoli second with 60 points. Uh, Inter Milan have 59 points, but they have an extra game. But they play Fiorentina in, in this game. This should be another cracking fixture. That's Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern. And by the way, Inter are the team against which Fiorentina have scored the most Serie A goals. Uh, and obviously, as well, since 2001, Inter have won 16 of their 19 Serie A home games against Fiorentina. But I wonder how much pressure is specifically for Simone and Zaghi, Jonathan Johnson, to see if they can catch up to Milan and Napoli. Yeah, absolutely. I think this game is more important for Inter than it is for Fiorentina, although I'm a bit worried for Fiorentina. It comes at a bit of an awkward moment where they sort of need that game in hand to be played to see exactly where they stand with regards to, to European qualification. But for Inter, 
I mean, four points behind AC Milan, uh, you know, uh, it's it, it's not where they would have wanted to be, especially after, you know, they sort of did the hard work where they, they turned the situation around, got themselves ahead of Napoli and Milan uh, and now find themselves uh, behind again. But with with Milan, I think it's it's really interesting how it sort of mirrored last season a little bit uh, in terms of them, you know, dropping out of Europe and then being able to focus on the on, on the league. And I think, um, you know, for Inter as well, going out to the Champions League, giving a good account of themselves against Liverpool uh, is going to be crucial for setting the tone for the remainder of this season because they really, they need to get themselves closer, uh, you know, to to the top of the table. I mean, they may well end up losing out now. Uh, four points is, could be fairly sizable, especially when you're coming up against tricky teams like Fiorentina. And there's quite a few of those tough fixtures that you get. Uh, as part and parcel of this this ultra competitive Serie A that we're enjoying right now, so you know I think this one it, it it's a must win for Inter. Whereas for Fiorentina, it's like well, if we avoid defeat, we've still got that game in hand, which can catch us up with the European places. It's times like this where I wish I could go back in time and nix the Vlahovic sale to Juve because <laughs> oh man, I, what he couldn't do against Real, I'm sure he wished. He was up because I, I think <laughs> yeah. he would be a menace for this Inter back line. Inter haven't looked. Christo Piatek, though, Michael Piatek is doing a friend of the show, by the way. Uh, you know, he, yeah. he's been, you know, he knows the league. He's been doing OK. Do you see Fiorentina at all with this side doing anything against Inter Milan? I know that they're away from home, but to JJ's point, uh, this is a tricky fixture. It is. I, I think at best they frustrate them and get a draw and force Inter into making certain mistakes. But Inter haven't looked the same since that Milan derby. They they looked flabbergasted, and especially Olivier Giroud. Who knew? No Ibra, but they still have Giroud. Who knew Giroud at the double would be the thing that would capsize their Serie A hopes? And offensively, they have looked a shadow of themselves. And I think it's down to the fact that Inzaghi – doesn't know what to do with that front three of Dzeko, Latoura Martinez, and Alexi Sanchez. The biggest issue with their attack is Ed and Dzeko, he had been scoring you goals, and then you started tinkering it because you were getting into European competition. And, and now that affects the dressing room a bit. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but I can guarantee you it, there's more drama for your mama in Serie A <laughs> because when you take a striker out that's experienced as Dzeko, that, that affects the chemistry and, and creates issues. Yeah, it was a I little. Th- yeah, go ahead, JJ. I, th- I think as well when you're a striker like Edin Dzeko, fantastic striker, so much experience. But at his age, you know, when you're on that kind of hot streak and then you get sort of taken in and out of the team, you know, it really it really tampers with you because this could be sort of your last real rich vein of form in your career, gi- given his age. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, I hope that he sticks around for a couple more years. We all know, uh, you know, how how people love to to sort of play out the the latter end of their careers in uh, in, in Serie A. It's, I don't know whether it's the uh, the the olive oil over there that uh, that keeps them going much longer than everyone else. But uh, you know, for me, it just it, it felt like. I felt like I was seeing Dzeko sort of out of the starting 11 picture too often, given the goals that he was banging in. And I think, you know, as great a player as I know he can be on his day, Alexis Sanchez, you know, he he is a real wild card option at this stage of his career, because as much as he can pop up and give you an important winning goal, which he's done a couple of times this season for Inter, I don't think he's at that point where he's ready to and consistent enough to be to be starting in a front line like Inter's where they're going to be challenging for the Serie A title and they were hoping to make progress in Europe as well. For me, you know, it has to be built around Martinez uh, and Dzeko. And, you know, once C- Simone Inzaghi started playing around with Dzeko, you know, it doesn't surprise me that suddenly the attack looks uh, a lot less convincing. Yeah, I think the home uh, advantage will hopefully give Inter some help. They've gained 32 points from uh, 14 home matches in Serie A this season. That's actually the most out of any team in Serie A. Give me some predictions very quick. Inter Milan, Fiorentina, Jonathan Johnson, and then Michael, you jump in. I'm going to go for... Hmm. I don't want to go for another two one. Yeah, uh, don't say two I'm, one, JJ. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to go exciting. I'm going to say three two. Ooh, I like three two to Inter. Three two to Inter. A home win for Inter Milan, mm-hmm. keeping their title hopes alive. Michael, I am going to stick with the goals for Fiorentina. I'm going to say a two two draw, and okay. there is going to be madness 
at the San Siro because <laughs> you, you know the drama is going to be coming. But two two draw Inter coming off the draw against Torino. I think it's going to there's going to be a bit of doubt, and I think they get the first goal. But then Fiorentina they fight their way back, and that doubt starts creeping in, and they bottle it for two two well, draw. Juventus is surely hoping for something like that as they look to creep up as well on Inter Milan because guess what? Juventus are fourth and they have a game extra over Inter, but they have only three points under them. They have 56 while Inter have 59. So this is getting even more interesting as we continue remaining fixtures in Serie A, of course, for this weekend. By the way, as we look to this weekend of action before the international break. Uh, Sassuolo, Spezia, Napoli hosting Udinese. Milan travel to Cagliari. Juventus, Salernitana. We've talked about the Rome Derby. Bologna, Atalanta, Empoli, Verona, Venezia, Sampdoria, and a few more right there. All of them on Paramount Plus, by the way. We have them all for you as well as our team. And again, don't forget, Colin Calcio every Thursday, 3 p.m., Eastern. All right, let's go from Italy to the Premier League. We had some midweek matches. We talked about them already, but let's talk about a London derby here. Tottenham against West Ham. Tottenham got a good win, of course, um, against Brighton midweek. West Ham still have to play Sevilla in the second leg as well in the Europa League. Michael, Tottenham, West Ham, the fight for fourth, although you think Arsenal mm. perhaps are holding on to it. What do you make of this London derby? I think it's more the fight for fifth. I, mm. I think this Tottenham team, they get it done against lower competition, but it's been these type of games that they've lost in this season. And they showed that against Manchester United. They went to Old Trafford. They had momentum. They had a couple wins. They had a couple great performances. And they just implode at the end of the day. But what I do like about them is they've gotten their best player on their team, Harry Kane, scoring goals again. When you have a Tottenham with Harry Kane scoring goals, Son Yun Min scoring goals and getting assists, that is the best Tottenham. And yeah. Kulisevsky, he's been a revelation for them. I, I think he could end up being the signing. If they get top four, he could end up being the signing of the season. Yeah, massive addition. Bentancur also playing uh, pretty well. But West Ham are sixth, uh, Tottenham are seventh, to, to Michael's point. JJ, this is probably about a fight for fifth. However, they're only, you know, three points uh, behind Arsenal in fourth, although Arsenal, of course, have a few games in hand. How do you see this one? Uh, West Ham Tottenham, that's a Sunday game. Yeah, to be honest, if I'm looking at this one, I'm not actually that worried about Arsenal. I'm actually looking at this more for United. I know mm. that Mike is not going to be uh, happy with me saying that, but given the way they went out of the Champions League, uh, you know, and looking at that game in hand that Spurs have, I mean, if Spurs do beat West Ham this weekend, uh, you know, that really puts them in the driving seat for fifth. So I, I think if I was looking at any team that might drop out of that top five at the moment, it's more likely to be United than, uh, than Arsenal, I think. Uh, you know, in Arsenal's performance against Liverpool the other day, we saw that, uh, you know, there there is enough there for them to, you know, battle it out up until the end of the season for that final Champions League spot. Uh, you know, and if worse comes to the worst, I think they might just about drop down into fifth very late on. But I think that's going to take a really strong run of form now from, uh, you know, perhaps from a Spurs. Uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see if Conte can get them firing the way that he wants. My feeling is that fifth is probably the best that Spurs can aim for this season ahead of a massive rebuild in the summer and Conte getting the best out of them and, and really pushing for Champions League qualification next season. So, you know, I think if I was United, I'd be looking over my shoulder at the likes of Spurs right now, especially if they get the result this weekend against West Ham, which I expect them to do. Yeah, and just like Inter, Tottenham actually do pretty well at home um, against uh, West Ham. They've only lost two of the last 19 matches, uh, by the way, in that fixture. You saw just then the remaining fixtures in the Premier League. Uh, JJ, we have to just, uh, we begin everything with uh, Arsenal traveling to the greatest club the world has ever seen. Uh, you saw Mikel Arteta complaining a little bit about the fixture. Uh, you know, it, I mean, he has a point, right? Arsenal had to play Wednesday against Liverpool and then the early morning game uh, at Villa Park. Though, you know, they're not the only club that suffer, but he has a point. Yeah, he has a point. I mean, who wouldn't be afraid of traveling to Villa Park? Uh, exactly. You know, less than uh, here we go. Here we go. Here we <laughs> go. No, I mean, I, I, I think lo looking at Villa's uh, position in the table at the moment, it makes me feel really frustrated because, you know, technically in terms of the positions, we're only two positions behind Spurs, but it's a chasm 
between Villa uh, and the rest of those teams sort of still in uh, European contention. You know, there's 10 points mm. behind, between Villa and Wolves, uh, even though we, we have a game in hand. So it really feels frustrating, like a couple of results, uh, you know, in the last couple of months, we've really thrown away our chances uh, of going for Europe because I fancy us being able to go uh, toe-to-toe with Arsenal, you know, on on our day when, when things start to click. And, you know, there have been moments under Gerard where we've looked very, very good. You know, Coutinho is suddenly, uh, you know, a fully functional player again doing what he does best uh you know we've got some fantastic performance uh in the midfield as well uh you know Ramsey is you know just goes from strength to strength uh, kind of grateful that he's not been called up to the England squad uh this time because I don't want there being too much hype about him moving on this mm. summer quite happy with him at Villa Park for the foreseeable future um so yeah, I can understand where where Arteta, what Arteta is getting at, because Villa are now one of those teams, especially since Gerard has come in, where none of the big teams are going to want to, you know, go and play us, uh, you know, especially on uh, on on home territory. I mean, we saw that with the way that the the team fought back against United uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, I can see why Arteta is a bit a bit miffed, uh, you know, that there's very li- very little turnaround time for them. I hear you on the Arteta shout about having to go and the complaints, but mind you, Arsenal have all these games in hand because they were granted permission to have these games and be exempt from playing because of COVID. You, yeah. you can't you can't have that and then complain. You can't have both worlds. You, yeah. you got to get on with it. If if other teams had to play with. Academy players, other teams had to play with a shorthanded team. And these are the same, this is the same arsenal that is talking, ah, top four, we got it. But then complaining on the other side, same old arsenal, always complaining. And from Villa's standpoint, you like your chances. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I love it. I love it. Where's James Benj when you need him? <laughs> oh, Benj, I, no, no, but you I make a good him. point. I mean, listen, the pandemic has affected everybody in, in, in different specific ways, but ultimately it's about how you handle the scheduling. It is a tricky thing, and obviously it's tricky enough because obviously they had a midweek game against Liverpool and then they had to play. Now they have to play the early kickoff against Villa. But to your point, Everybody has had to deal with so many situations. I mean, it wasn't yeah. too long ago that, you know, our children had to play uh, Liverpool in a cup game as well. It's it's a very difficult, tricky situation. But, you know, at this point, no excuses. Just try and get the job done as we also continue to get back to normalcy. There's also the FA Cup, by the way. Uh, that's why there's not that many fixtures in the Premier League. And there's some tasty ones, of course, uh, as we reach the quarterfinals. It's not just the Champions League, but it's the FA Cup. It's Middlesbrough against Chelsea. We've already talked about, obviously, you know, what happened there. But it's Middlesbrough against Chelsea. Palace against Everton. It's probably the last thing that Frank Lampard needs. Another game in his scheduling uh, because they're trying to stay in the Premier League. Southampton hosting Man City and Nottingham Forest uh, against Liverpool. By the way, there's a great quote, boys, that Jurgen Klopp said. Um after beating Arsenal. And I'm just going to read it right here. It's so good. Let's see. He became Emily Dickinson in this one. He was asked about momentum and Klopp said, we have momentum, but momentum is the most fragile flower on the planet. Someone steps on it and it is gone. Jurgen Klopp, I feel like that's such a beautiful (laughs) line. (laughs) But do you think uh, in terms of these FA Cup matches, do you think Jonathan Johnson, is this uh, too much of a, Headache for them at this point or, you know, Liverpool still going for a, a, a historic quadruple, I guess, as well. You know, do you think that it's a, a hindrance? I mean, I, I mentioned Everton as well. Or is this a welcoming thing as they look to to get more trophies? No, I don't think it's necessarily a hindrance because when when you're as big a club as they are, you you want to challenge for for every piece of silver we're going. You know, you kind of relish the the the, the challenge the, that comes with all of these games and such uh, short turnaround uh, time. You know, perhaps that's a sign that Arsenal aren't yet ready to be challenging for silverware again if they don't have that kind of mentality, that hunger to be playing every couple of days. Uh, and I think as well, Liverpool, when they get to this stage of the season, I mean, okay, it wasn't the case last campaign, but it is the case again this uh, this one. You know they're 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 like a train that's really really difficult to stop. You know they've mm. got this momentum, uh, you know, going behind them. 
and you know it really wouldn't surprise me uh, if that momentum carries them past City and suddenly changes the complexion uh, of the title race. I mean, perhaps something will have to give. You know, they're still in the Champions League, as you said. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it is the FA Cup. Uh, you know, that takes the hit, but. Uh, you know, you'd, you'd have to say that on paper, it's probably the most favorable fixture uh, of all the, the big clubs remaining coming up against Forest. No disrespect to Forest. Obviously, there's plenty of pedigree there. But, uh, you know, I think that Liverpool, uh, you know, will probably feel that they can maybe rotate a little bit, uh, you know, which mm. allows them to still prioritize the title race in the Premier League uh, and also pushing on further in the Champions League. Now they're in the quarterfinals draw. I remember when Manchester United won the treble, there was something that they didn't have before that season, which they had depth. They could rotate Teddy Sheringham in and bring in Dwight York to play with him or Andy Cole to, to partner. And Liverpool have that now where in a game like Arsenal in the Premier League, you can rest a Bobby Firmino and Mohamed Salah and still be very competitive and, and not just do just enough, but go toe to toe with them and then bring in your sluggers to give a knockout blow. And you do that with the mindset of competing on all fronts. So those teams that go on to do the business, to go on to make history, they take it one game at a time. Liverpool have taken it one game at a time of saying, okay, how do we make up this ground against City? And that Leeds game was a big one. And then this Arsenal game is a big one, which it just gives much more belief. And the picture changes per game. Now you're one point behind City and you still have to play them and the picture will change again when they play City, just as the picture will change again when they play Nottingham of can they compete for this FA Cup. If they get the surprise cup exit, hey, a treble is still a very viable thing for this Liverpool team. Yeah, it should be a great game against Nottingham Forest. Uh, it should be a great atmosphere, especially up front. They have uh, Keenan, Andrei Shevchenko, Davis as well. Uh, so that should be a very good one. All right, JJ, very quick on League uh, uh Marseille against Nice, PSG against Monaco, uh, specifically, you know, that latter, I guess, two teams who once upon a time, you know, uh, celebrating the joys of of titles. Of course, you know, PSG looks like they're still win Liga, but, you know, uh, they're dealing with a few issues. Give, give us a little bit of a, a Liga uh, lowdown on both these games, PSG against Monaco and uh, OM against Nice. Yeah, there was like a, a bit of a short-lived period where PSG Monaco was billed as like the Cachico or Le, Le Cachique to give it a, a French Le flavor. Le Cachique, I love it. <laughs> because the, the fixture was so moneyed. And uh, to be honest, it's funny, this season or this this particular clash between them feels the poorest it's felt in a while. You know, PSG licking their wounds after crashing out of the Champions League. Monaco are probably going to join them in exiting uh, the Europa League. Uh, they're down against Braga. We'll see what happens after this recording. Uh, you know, but I'm not expecting Monaco's European adventure to be prolonged there. They've really struggled. They they made their managerial change. Kovac out. Uh, Philippe Clement, who did so well with Club Brugge over the years in uh, in the Champions League coming in, but it still hasn't worked out. Monaco is still struggling to get themselves into contention for uh, you know European qualification. I, I liken them a little bit to Ferrari in Formula One, where you know they've got that sort of reputation, that that glitz and that glamour, but they've struggled to put it together. Uh, you know the consistent form in recent years, uh, and again. You know, it's looking like it's going to be touch and go to see if they even get into Europe. I think that, on the other hand, that Marseille-Nice clash, southern rivalry between the two, is looking very tasty. Marseille losing a bit of form at the worst possible time, uh, you know, and they're starting to get dragged back into that fight uh, for any of the, the potential European Cups. They could get Champions League, they could still qualify for the Europa League, or they could be dropping down into the Conference League. So they, they've got plenty to play for, but this Nice side, you know, kudos to Christophe Galtier. You know, we know, uh, you know, he, he did a fantastic job with Lille last season, leading them to the to the title. He's taken Nice to the Coupe de France final this season and could still lead Nice to, to finishing second behind PSG in his first season with this uh, shiny new project that he has on the South Coast. So doing a fantastic job there and, and Nice, you know, looking like they're going to push Marseille all the way, regardless of the result of this game I this weekend. It. 
I love it. Uh, a league uh, lowdown. Thank you there, JJ. All right, some other games to 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 take note. By the way, uh, some big games around Europe and beyond. Ajax against Feyenoord. Ajax are just two points clear of PSV. By the way, Tigres against Rayados. Tigres are third in Liga MX and uh, Monterrey sixth uh, right now. El Clásico del Norte. Cone against Dortmund. That's a Gio Reyna watch. Uh, it's a big weekend for US MNT yeah, players. On by that, the way. Uh, on, on yeah. that Cologne Dortmund game, uh, it's actually a big one because I think I read earlier that they're finally able to have a full capacity crowd for the first time in what seems Ooh. like forever. So they're going to be up. For that, that 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 yeah. changes, uh, you know, uh, the, the the image for for Bundesliga. Cologne, fantastic, uh, you know, place for for football. Great atmosphere. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Michael, on any of those games uh, interest you? Uh, I'm I'm intrigued by the Ajax one. It's it's been a it's been a few seasons since we've had something to talk about in the in the era mm. But this Ajax team, such an underwhelming result against Benfica in the Champions League, and their manager now. I'm interested to see how his focus is. This something that he's motivated by to close out his Ajax career? Do you but, want you him, know, Michael? Do you want him in United? Would you like him? Do I want? Him? <laughs> I, Luis, I've I've i I've, I've wanted him since two seasons ago. I, I tried I tried to put an Amazon Prime order on him. You tattooed to, Eric Ten Hag on your arm. Yeah. Is this yeah, is this I, over yeah. is this over Pochettino or would it be one or the other? Wait, who? Of Pochettino. course, over Pochettino. No. <laughs> Never heard of Pochettino about a month ago. So he's your number <laughs> one choice. Eric Ten Hag would oh, be your number one choice. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There, he the thing I the thing I I love about him is he would. Come Come in and clean out garbage. Um, yeah. there, there's just too much stuff, too much dead wood going yeah. on at the club. And there uh, at least at least Donny would get time. a game in midfield when he comes back from loan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Donny, you know what? Do, Donny would be the captain overnight. <laughs> yeah. The, the reason why I think Eric Ten Hag would be great for Manchester United is exactly what you just said. There's a lot of noise, a lot of mm. things, uh, problems that have nothing to do with the football for the majority uh, uh, time. And that's not something that Manchester United has been used to for so long. And now they need somebody to just, the problem is, I feel it's going to take more than just Eric Ten Hag. You kind of need to really press the reset button everywhere, right? Sporting you know, director wise. You, you, know, you, know, you know what? I might play devil's advocate a little bit. We get, we've talked so much about what Chelsea's current situation might mean for their future. Imagine Thomas Tuchel is suddenly on the market. Well, that's what, uh, you're doing the Jamie no. Carragher page. I do like it. Yeah, that would be that. JJ, no. do you want Chelsea fans to come at our house and say they're already angry? Man, man, one of one of my one of my best friends in my childhood was a Chelsea fan, so I've been making Chelsea fans angry for decades. <laughs> Nothing new. Hey, listen, <laughs> you've had it good for so long, all right. So, uh, but Michael, wrapping up on Ten Hag, I agree. I think that's a thing. But Pochettino would not interest you. No, not at all. I I, I was I was severely disappointed. It it was a flashback to the Tottenham days, mm. watching that PSG Real Madrid and. That was always going to be a difficult match for him, but that was a match that needed management. It took him too long to make a change, and he he looked overwhelmed and flabbergasted, and almost of flashbacks of the Champions League final when he had that. He has this facial expression that it's mayday, mayday. I don't know what to do, <laughs> and then we you know what we don't need that at Old Trafford. We we got we have enough of that. So. Yeah, it's all, it's already there. Last it's right. when, it's yeah. when you realize Spursy has come back to haunt you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think that, uh, especially from his Espanol days and Southampton days, there is a good manager there. It's just sometimes, yeah. uh, you know, two things have to mesh. All right. By the way, uh, regarding that Dortmund game at Colonas, uh, 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 Jonathan Johnson was talking about regarding, uh, you know, make sure to follow in soccer. We trust a brand new show uh, and YouTube channel that will cover all things soccer in the U S Jimmy Conrad, Heath beers, Charlie Davis will be all over the upcoming world cup qualifier. So make sure to follow that and subscribe. All right. Well, let's just do final thoughts here, by the way, as we say, Goodbye. There's a lot to discuss. The start of the Challenge Cup, some MLS as well. Austin FC, Michael Lahu. Let's see how far they can keep going. But there's a lot more action. But give me final thoughts from anywhere. Michael, give me your final thoughts. I think uh, keep an eye on the English Premier League. I think this weekend and the next couple of weeks, you're going to see the sand start to settle on those Champions League places. The, the two biggest storylines, the Liverpool City game 
mm. which is to come that it's all building up towards that for a title race run in, but keep an eye on those champions league spots and European spots. I think that's we're, we're going to see some big shifts in that. Yeah. JJ. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm actually going to throw in a, 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 an interesting little update because the French squad was named earlier. Christopher Nkunku finally called up uh, at senior level by Didier Deschamps, so that's uh, definitely something to look forward to in the international break. Jonathan Klos as well of Lens, a player I'm really a big fan of. Uh, you know, filling a position of need for for France as well on that right hand side. We saw Kingsley Coman uh, experimenting with a wing back role uh, a couple of months ago. Did very well, but uh, you know, something that I'm not necessarily sure was going to be sustainable for France and you know you just look at those squads again not just the senior squad but the under 21 you know some of the names in there it's just crazy Camavinga, Saliba, Guerrero. uh you know there's just so much talent it's uh it's crazy so always an exciting time to watch the French national team even if it's just uh, a bunch of international friendlies this break. Yeah, as a Peruvian, I have the uh, emoji version of eyes rolling. Like uh, it, they're under twenty one. So just ridiculous. Hey JJ, very quickly, why is Lucas Dean in there? He's hurt. Is it is it just uh, purely just to get him part of the chemistry? What's going on? Or maybe we yeah. have an update on Lucas Dean. Well, poss- possibly it is. Uh, it, it is just to get him to join up with the group, be checked out by the doctors. I mean, I mm-hmm. think because uh, because of, of what Deschamps was saying in the press conference earlier, he talking about the opportunity to bring in guys like Klos and, and Nkunku to test them out because it's not competitive fixtures. I think what he'll want to do is just you know check up on on the injury, make sure there's nothing too serious. Obviously, if Dean could play a part, he might keep him around. I don't think he'll run him into the ground during the training sessions. There's no there, there's no reason to do that it could be that he simply turns up has a medical checkup and then uh gets dismissed somebody else gets called up or the squad just uh remains as it is with uh, no replacement uh no replacement taken but yeah it's it's true that uh, you know i did sort of raise an eyebrow a little bit when i saw that dean was uh w- was named in there especially when you look at so many of those names that could have been uh you know included in this uh in this squad no kurt zuma as well as the uh uh, as as the investigation into him and his behavior with his uh, cat uh, rightfully gets underway. God, that seems like three years ago. I don't even yeah. remember that stuff. Unbelievable. But anyway, that is the end of our weekend preview. By the way, we have so much more to give you, including interviews, recaps. We'll be coming back on the weekend for our recap as well. And also, we still continue in the international break, everybody. And Soccer We Trust takes care of all USMNT content. But here at Kegolasso, we're going to have so much more, including my beloved South America. We'll talk more about Europe. Also, African qualifiers, Michael Lahu. That's right. We have a lot to discuss around the globe because this game is all over, baby. And Kegolasso covers it just for you. Michael Lahoud, thank you so much, my friend. Uh, thank you for having me on. Love being on the show and cannot wait to watch weekend matches. I love it. I love it, ML. Jonathan Johnson, thank you, buddy. Guys, been a pleasure again. So looking forward to the next time already. Absolutely. Enjoy the beginning to your weekend whenever you listen to this. Enjoy the games, as Michael just said. We will be back with much, much more. Kego Lasso Pod on Twitter, youtube.com forward slash Kego Lasso, Michael LaHood, Jonathan Johnson, LME. We will see you next time. Till then. <laughs>